Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Webinar Wednesday, a training provided by NASCAST as part of the Weatherization Plus Health Initiative. This afternoon's webinar is an introduction to um, healthy homes, and it will be uh, presented by Ruth Ann Norton of the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. Before we begin, I'd like to just share the format of the webinar with everyone. All of the attendees are on mute, um, but you will have the capability to ask questions using the chat feature of the webinar. So if you have a question, you can just type it in and have it sent to the organizer. And we will be breaking periodically throughout the webinar to entertain those questions. Um, and if there are any questions that we are unable to answer, we will be following up with you all via email after the webinar. So at this point, I am going to turn things over to Ruth Ann. Thank you very much, Raymond, and uh, welcome everyone to a bright and sunny Baltimore, Maryland, uh, where we're broadcasting from today. I am joined by my colleagues Wes Stewart, who's in the uh, room with me here in Baltimore, and Michael McKnight, who's in our Washington, D.C. office. Um, we're delighted to participate and be a part with our partners at NASCAF the Weatherization Webinar Wednesdays. Um, as we go through the broadcast today, uh, keep in mind that we will direct you to some very good resources at the end of the slides that you can go back and find out some further information to of note uh, the new weatherizationplushealth.org website, which I recommend highly is one of the most uh, informational and effective websites on, in, in the field, and also the Green and Healthy Homes uh, .org website, which is the website of our organization. Uh, for those who do not know, uh, Green and Healthy Homes um, is also known to many people as the Coalition to End Childhood Lead Poisoning. Uh, after 25 years, we are making a uh, name transition over the next year. Uh, the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative works in 16 cities uh, throughout the United States, uh, building on collaborative partnerships uh, to affect systems change, uh, where we are looking at houses uh, holistically, uh, creating a single portal of intake for families to come into a housing intervention system, um, whether it be weatherization or health and safety, and to look at those issues uh, together and to perform integrated interventions. Our goal is to ensure the creation of energy efficient, healthy, and safe housing uh, for America's children and seniors and families. Um, the, the coalition itself was started in 1986 um, in Baltimore and has a long history of success in working toward our mission of ending lead poisoning and creating green, healthy, and safe houses. So we're going to get going on today's uh, crash course, uh, if you will, and uh, talk about uh, the elements of what we consider um, healthy homes. In the, in the first uh, phase of the advent of the Healthy Homes movement, which began back uh, really in the 90s as a, as an outgrowth of the lead poisoning prevention work in the United States, um, there were always seven elements of a health, healthy home. Uh, as uh, energy efficiency and weatherization were more and more viewed um, as important elements of health, um, and as more investments were made, especially around uh, the American Recovery Act um, into weatherization as the largest rehab program in America, uh, the healthy homes industry adopted the eighth element um, as thermally controlled and energy efficient. But the, the elements of the healthy house, as you see here, are keeping it contaminant free, uh, pest free, clean and dry, well ventilated, safe, well maintained, and thermally controlled. We're going to talk about each of those elements, but as you can see, um, a green, healthy, and safe home is really one uh, based in common sense practices. So let's talk about keeping it contaminant free. Um, the, our pathway into this field, lead poisoning, uh, is a major factor in this. Um, so the contaminants that we look at generally in this field are, are lead, uh, radon, which has been in the news a lot and has been uh, elevated as an issue uh, regarding lung cancer, which we will again talk about. Asbestos, pesticides, uh, volatile organic compounds that come from uh, sealants and paints, 
and combustion byproducts, those things uh, that can cause fumes or other uh, indoor air quality issues. So let's take each of these and take a look. So lead-based paint was banned uh, by Congress for uh, use in the United States for residential properties in 1978. It was actually banned in Baltimore City first uh, in the U.S. in 1951, but the entire country in 1978. That was uh, over a half uh, a century after the uh, League of Nations um, signed an international treaty to ban the use of lead-based paint in 1922, the U.S. being the only country, developed country, who didn't sign that. But that what that left us with was a toxic legacy of lead in the United States. Um, there are approximately 38 million homes built before 1978 that contain uh, lead hazards. About 24 million of those have active accessible hazards, meaning uh, chipping, peeling, flaking paint, or distressed conditions. Um, the higher risk homes were built before 1950 and, and 1940 when there was a higher concentration of lead in homes. This map from 1950 just gives you a sense of the scope of the problem in the U.S. for lead-based paint. The main pathway for poisoning out of, out of old chipping, peeling, flaking lead-based paint really is lead dust. That's the breakdown of, the, of, of uh, lead paint. Uh, you can find that often on banisters and porches. Uh, you'll find it on exteriors. Um, and then the, the generation of lead dust, uh, is, is caused by the deterioration and the breakdown of that chipping, feeling, peeling, or flaking paint. It will often look like alligator skin if you look at uh, lead paint. Uh, but the friction surfaces include doors that abrade, uh, window wells and sills and sashes, the, the up and down motion of windows and the friction, and then also on floors where there's a lot of striking of feet and surfaces. Uh, it should be, keep in mind that it takes approximately uh, three granules of leaded dust to start poisoning a child. So very little lead um, can start to, to poison a child and provide um, unfortunate outcomes such as learning disabilities and attention deficit disorder, violent behavior, but it also leads to long-term uh, health effects. There are 535,000 kids known to be poisoned by lead in the U.S. every year, that's one in 38 children. To give you some perspective, um, autism, um, which is prevalent and often in the news, is one in every 88 children. So lead, lead's prevalence still remains very high. So it's through renovation activities um, that can disturb lead-based paint, so not only through weatherization and aging, but through improper renovation, uh, you can often see chips in um, peeling flaking paint, but also lead dust that's left behind. If not properly contained and cleaned up, uh, this can be a major source of poisoning. And we'll talk about some resources and uh, laws related to renovation that help uh, to address this. So repairing, chipping, peeling, and flaking paint using lead safe work practices and certified workers is one of the most important things we can do to limit exposure. If you see chipping, peeling, or flaking paint, you should never dry scrape it. You should never burn it. You need to use proper containment. You need to ensure that we're using uh, wet uh, methods, sweating down the surfaces before scraping. Occupants of, should always be kept out of the work area. Only certified EPA trained or, or state trained certified workers should be in the area. And certainly no pregnant women and no children should be in a property while there is lead hazard control or lead-based paint work going on. Cleanup is a major key to limiting lead exposure because you do not want to leave behind that toxic leaded dust. So the EPA came up with the renovation, repair, and painting rules uh, in 2010. And uh, we're going to give you a little background on that. So it, it applies to any contractor in the United States who performs work for compensation that is working in a pre-1978 constructed residence or a child-occupied facility, child care facility. If there's a disturbance of lead-painted surfaces uh, and that there's more than six square feet of interior painted surface disturbed or 20 square feet of exterior painted surfaces. Now this may be more strict in other states around the country, in Maryland, uh, the restrictions are two square feet 
um, rather than six. And so there, you do have some stricter uh, laws that apply in many states around the country, and we can help you if you have questions about your state. If you want more information on the EPA RRP rule, we suggest you go to epa.gov slash lead or to the joint site run by the Coalition on Childhood Lead Poisoning, HUD, and EPA called www.leadfreekids.org. So at, it, under EPA RRP, um, contractors must um, always distribute a uh, piece of educational material brochure called Renovate Right. It provides a lot of information for the occupant and the owner to understand what the process uh, will be and what the risks are uh, in uh, homes with lead-based paint or facilities. Um, there should be a pre-intervention inspection uh, and uh, testing that will go on, um, visual, visual inspection and testing that will go on. The requirement of lead safe work practices, so every contractor must have gone through training and then trained uh, their workers. Contractors will have uh, ID cards and certification that um, uh, clients should look at. And then there should be a post-intervention inspection. Uh, in all states, that is a, uh, a method that EPA has determined to look at on um, the uh, swipe of, of, of they do, they do a swipe test afterwards, but only in Maryland is there a lead dust test uh, that will be required starting in January 14 that every renovation and repair job must be passed by lead dust clearance. Otherwise, it's the EPA uh, standard for, for clearance. So for lead-based paint under 11.6, um, what does it really tell us to do under the DOE lead-based paint? Basically, if in the course of the weatherization job there will be a disturbance, if you have to cut into a wall that has a leaded surface or trim, or you have to remove a window uh, in order to do the repair, um, then, um, then you are allowed to uh, replace that and you must use lead safe work practices. You're not allowed to replace, for example, a leaded window in an area that would not be disturbed through the weatherization process. Um, because it has a code compliance that may have a lead violation or a health code compliance if it's not related to weatherization, um, if it is not impairing the energy efficiency of the home and therefore not part of the repair, it cannot be funded uh, with WAP funding. I'll encourage Michael and uh, Wes to always pipe in, uh, make sure that I'm uh, on point on all of these two as well. So radon is another exposure uh, that we look at in healthy homes. And a lot has been in the news with radon recently. It's the second leading cause of lung cancer in the U.S. with about 21,000 cancer risks. There is a map, which we're going to show you in just a moment, that you can go on um, that can look at the zones for radon um, in terms of intensity of risk. But what EPA says is that everyone should test their home to be safe uh, for radon. About 1 in 15 homes are above the EPA level of concern, uh, which we'll talk about here. So if you look at the map, uh, the darker shaded areas are the higher risks of radon. Uh, the yellow shaded areas are the lesser risk. I was uh, noting that this is much around a lot of the major mountain chains seem to be uh, the areas of highest risk here. Um, I would not take that as scientific fact. It was just no I was noticing that. Um, here, but you can go onto the EPA website and, and check your zone for risk. Radon can get into the home through a lot, a lot of different ways, but mainly it's coming through the soil and uh, through soil and water tables. It's coming out of fractured bedrock and, and uh, through groundwater. And so any cracks or openings in, in a home, especially in the basements or foundations of home, begin the process to allow radon gas to seep into the home. It can seep in through, uh, again, both the water table, so it can end up all the way into your shower uh, and into um, your faucet, uh, and also in through sump pumps and other cracks in areas um, in a home. So there are radon te te test kits that are available. EPA uh, will often have those available for distribution, and a lot of uh, healthy homes programs will have them for distribution or use them in their, um, in their uh, review and testing. 
there are two types of kits. Uh, there's short-term and long-term kits. Uh, those short-term kits run about three to four days. They're little disks or sponges that are set out. Um, and same for the long-term test kits. The long-term kits can run as long as 12 months. Uh, there's a small difference of about $10 in the price of these testing uh, kits. Uh, radon levels in a building will often change on a day-to-day -day basis, mainly because of airflow. Um, and um, the longer you're able to uh, have that testing, the, the more accurate uh, you can probably confirm the risk. Uh, but we're looking at risk, anything above uh, four picocuries uh, or more, there should be some remediation done uh, in a home. But it doesn't mean that your, if your home is at a 3.5 or if the home you're, you're doing intervention in is at, is at a 3.5 picocuries, that it's safe. Basically, like lead, there is no safe level of radon, and so attention should be paid to any, any radon level, making sure there's proper ventilation and proper care. So the average indoor radon level is estimated to be about 1.3 picocures. Um, what Congress has done is set a long-term goal that indoor radon levels should be no more than outdoor levels. So we're talking about uh, reducing that to about two picocures or below. Um, the EPA, as I said, believes that any radon exposure carries some risk. There's no safe level of radon, and we don't, uh, certainly don't want people being, having chronic exposure to radon. Radon's been reported not only in uh, coming from basements and water tables, but uh, some may have seen in the news that even uh, granite countertops are off-gassing on radon. Um, so radon levels below four picocures do pose some risk. And you can reduce your risk of lung cancer by lowering um, the radon level. So let's talk about how we do that. So number one, we're recommending uh, that you use a contractor who has the technical knowledge and special skills um, to fix the radon problem. Um, the qualified contractor can study that problem in your home and be able to help look at the right uh, treatment method. Um, but the primary system for um, for addressing radon in the home is to use a PVC piping which will pull radon from beneath the house and venting to the outside. Uh, EPA recommends that if possible you vent through the roof. Uh, you may have seen these, uh, these, these uh, PVC pipes as a radon remediation method before. This is uh, known as actually as a soil uh, suction radon system. Uh, sounds like a high-tech high name, doesn't it? Um, it doesn't require major changes to the home, but it's really important to move that uh, radon and off-gas it outside of the home. Also important to this is sealing foundation cracks and other openings to help the system be more effective and cost efficient. Some contractors may recommend simply sealing cracks and openings um, as long as you have proper airflow in the home. Mostly that's not seen as a fit, as, as a, a, a highly recommended uh, way to do it, but some contractors may do it as a lower cost uh, measure. Uh, but similar systems may be installed in houses with crawl spaces, as the soil suction systems may be installed in crawl spaces as well as coming uh, from beneath the house. Uh, so your radon contractor can use other methods that may work in the home, and they're going to look at that right system to depend on the design of the home or the other factors. With this, is, as through all the other methods uh, or other areas we talk about today. If you have questions, please make sure you uh, put them into the chat section, or you can contact me at ranorton at ghhi.org, and we'll be sure to get you uh, further information or quest your questions answered. So DOE says in their 11.6 guidance on radon uh, that when uh, site conditions permit, exposed dirt must be covered. Uh, with a vapor barrier, um, except for for immobile homes. And where radon present, uh, precautions should be taken to reduce the likely, likelihood of making radon issues worse. So obviously, you don't want to do things that will put further cracks or openings into the foundation. Uh, the further exposing of dirt uh, would not uh, be helpful. And the testing may be allowed as an allowable cost where you have a high radon potential and high risk, if you look at that. Uh, EPA uh, map. 
So the next uh, issue that we're looking at is asbestos. Um, it's most commonly found in older homes. It's uh, around, uh, you'll see it often as insulation around pipe and furnace insulation materials. But it's also in shingles, in millboard, uh, textured paints, and other coating materials and floor tiles. If you've seen old painted walls that look like they have specks of almost fiber in them, uh, that's probably asbestos uh, in the paint. Um, and, and breathing of radon, or of, sorry, of asbestos fibers uh, can lead to uh, another risk of lung cancer, to mesothelioma, uh, which is a cancer lining of the chest and abdominal cavity. You may have seen lots of ads for that on television for people who work in the steel factories as well. And then also asbestosis, is a condition that occurs where the lungs become scarred uh, with fibrous tissue. Very little asbestos to get into the lungs can cause permanent uh, damage and, and actually can lead to, to death. So asbestos in the house is, can be in many areas, as you can see in this uh, model uh, on the left of, of places that you can see it around fireplaces, insulation around mechanicals, tiles for the roof, um, insulation in the attic. If, if you look to the right, you can see some of this old coverage with piping where it's torn. Um, so you have exposed asbestos there. You um, can often find it in weatherization and verbiculite uh, insulation that, that has been there, uh, will, which would need to be tested. And sometimes around appliances, um, in furnace logs, and even in automotives in your garage, the brake linings um, can contain asbestos. So if you think there's asbestos in the home, Leave it alone if you're not a qualified contractor. And if it's intact, you definitely want to leave it uh, in place. If it has to be remediated, definitely using a licensed specialist is, is critically important. And that specialist should provide, and the, any assessor should provide, uh, owner, res, owner and resident notification if asbestos is detected at all so that residents and occupants can prepare um, for proper measures to protect themselves. And in the DOE guidance for 11.6, uh, this is exactly uh, the tact that is taken. So if there's asbestos shingles or tiles um, that are in the pathway of where weatherization uh, needs to occur or measures occur, a removal uh, is recommended, um, not, and, and not to break it apart or not to chip it, uh, but to to do a, a removal of any siding, uh, not cutting or drilling, but taking out in whole those pieces uh, where possible that are needed to insulate the interior. If it's in the vermiculite in the insulation, um, it, it should be, unless testing determines otherwise, uh, measures should be taken um, for protection. Uh, if it is found to have, have asbestos, it should be left in place. Um, and where blower tests are performed, the best practice is to perform pressurization instead of depressurization. Encapsulation by appropriately trained uh, professionals are allowed. Removal is not allowed uh, under 11.6. And then asbestos on pipes, furnaces, and other small covered surfaces. Um, you should assume asbestos is present in covering materials if it appears uh, to be so. Assume it to be asbestos and treat it. Uh, as such, a capsulation is allowed by a, a, a certified professional and should be conducted prior to any blower door testing. Uh, you certainly do not want to be doing anything that's going to blow around or um, exacerbate uh, the uh, movement of asbestos fibers. Removal may be allowed um, on a case-by-case -case basis, so consultation um, is the key here. So the next uh, hazard that we look at is VOCs, or volatile organic compounds. Um, often there, there are admitted gases from solids or liquids. Um, VOCs are higher indoors, about 10 times higher indoors uh, than outdoors. Uh, so this, the old adage and the, the fact that we're often breathing much more polluted and toxic air inside our home is, is uh, clear here. Um, examples of paint, I love the, the pink paint here. Um, but paints and lacquers, paint strippers and cleaning supplies, pesticides, building materials, furnishings, 
those things that have that high fume smell, you definitely know that you've got uh, VOCs. Uh, graphic and, and craft materials, and glues and adhe adhesives. If you want to learn a little bit more about VOCs, EPA has a, a great uh, site on it under, under their indoor air quality. Um, so it's epa.gov slash IAQ slash VOC. So you want to, you want to have source control on VOCs. Uh, remove those unused chemicals in the home uh, if you do not need them or certainly put them in uh, a storage closet that is made to contain uh, hot VOC and toxic materials. Um, you want to have good ventilation and climate control. Increasing ventilation, uh, keeping moisture and humid, relative humidity as low as possible uh, will help in tamping down uh, VOC levels in the home. The most effective way to limit VOCs is to limit the potential sources. Use non-VOC paints, uh, carpeting and others if you can do it. Um, and always dilute where possible uh, if you have VOCs in the home um, through fresh air. But in the marketplace today, you should be able to uh, be pretty VOC free in most of what, uh, what you're using. Formaldehyde is another issue that came up in some of the Chinese drywall and uh, attic materials over the past over the years uh, here. But passive formaldehyde monitors are easy are the easiest way to measure uh, for formaldehyde. Uh, test kits can be ordered from various vendors and from uh, places like Home Depot stores and uh, the like. Uh, the acceptable formaldehyde level is less than 0.1 uh, part per million. So to reduce high formaldehyde levels, uh, obviously one is to use non-formaldehyde products. Uh, that's uh, uh, using alternative products or replacing uh, those materials with uh, alternative products. Ensuring combustion sources are properly maintained and vented so that uh, we're improving the indoor air quality there. Allowing products to off-gas before bringing the products in. So if you have ply board or other things that have uh, formaldehyde, um, you will not use them if possible. But if you do have those, those uh, materials, you want to make sure that you give them time to breathe off uh, outside before bringing them in. Uh, making sure that if you have products that are in use or that you're disturbing with uh, formaldehyde, that you're keeping windows where possible open. Uh, you've got proper fans and ventilation uh, moving through your HVAC systems and others. And you want to control the climate, keeping temperatures and humidity levels low. As they go up, it's, it kind of makes uh, common sense, the, so do the chemicals released. The warmer the environment, the more moist the environment, uh, the more chemicals that are going to be released into the air. So what does DOE say here about in 11.6? So they talk about it, the health effect being asthma episodes um, and looking at formaldehyde, and VOCs, and other air pollutants. And so the removal of pollutants are, is allowed um, and is required if they pose a risk to the workers. Um, if a pollutant poses a risk to workers and removal cannot be performed or is not allowed by the client, it would force a deferral of the unit. We certainly would, would recommend here um, that it be, everything be removed if possible. If it's not allowed, if not able to be removed, client education is going to be critical here so that we don't leave behind um, issues uh, that we haven't uh, provided good education on as well. So moving on to keeping it pest-free and keeping it clean, uh, two more elements um, that, that we want to address here. I'm sorry, Ruthann, yeah. before, before we go into that, I just want to stop and um, take a few questions that we had regarding the other things. Sure. Um, the, the first question um, was about someone wants to know what testing you were referring to um, for finding uh, asbestos and vermiculite. Um, they say that they thought that the EPA recommended presuming asbestos was present until better test methodologies were developed and approved. Yes, um, I thought I had said that, and I apologize if I didn't. It was in the slide. I think it does say that the first thing is to, to presume 
Um, but Wes, do you, uh, do you want to talk about other testing methods? Yes. So certified contractors may use, uh, they may have testing methods that they do use. So, but to clarify, Raymond, if, if, it, if it looks like or appears to be asbestos, you should always assume it to be asbestos unless testing proves otherwise. So if I was not clear, I do want to be clear on that. Okay, and then the next question, what about in states where asbestos um, in residential properties is not regulated? You should, you should use the same assumption method. Um, and um, so there's, but you're saying if the, if the contractor, there is no uh, qualification for contractors, if, if that's what's being um, done, we, we do recommend that you would uh, find contractors who have been certified. Um, if not, you don't want to, you do not want to disturb uh, asbestos uh, if it's intact. If it's not intact, uh, they should contact us and we, can, and we can help them find a certified contractor or trained contractor in their area or has been trained in, in a state nearby. Okay, and then the next question. Are states enforcing the requirements for weatherization technicians to have the lead safe weatherization training for work on pre-78 housing? Uh, to our knowledge, there is very good enforcement that's going on across the states on, on the um, enforcement of training. Um, we are not aware that that, that, uh, that was an issue in question, I think, a number of years ago. But I think both EPA and DOE have done a fantastic job, as have the locals in doing that. Um, so in the states that we're working, we're seeing really good results on that. Wes, I don't, and Michael, I don't know. Right. In terms of enforcement, EPA is the enforcing agency for the EPA RRP rule, but there are local states in terms of 12 states that have been designated to actually do enforcement in their local jurisdictions. They're EPA authorized states, and those states are actually conducting the enforcement activities if you're one of those states. Um, and going to the EPA website, there's a great website on the RRP rule that people can quickly get that information in terms of is their state one of the authorized states by the EPA. Okay, and then the final question. Does the WAP funding cover radon test kits, or are the weatherization employees just recommending the test is done? I think that they're not, they're not covering the testing uh, kits. They're covering the covering of dirt. Michael, I'll, I'll make sure that I'm correct on that, because you're my radon uh, expert. Their testing is, is, uh, is, can be allowable. Now, um, you'd have to check with the state uh, based on the state health and safety plan, but uh, from 11-6, testing is allowable if the home is in one of the high-risk zones. Right. I'm sorry. Yes, in the high-risk zone. Yes. Okay. And just so everyone on the call knows, we will be providing uh, these slides as well as a recording of this webinar on the website uh, following the webinar. A lot of people have been asking that. And so now we're going to give it back to you, Ruthann. Okay. And I do, I do want to reiterate, uh, test kits may be covered as, as long as you're um, You've checked in on the plan in, in the high-risk areas. Um, so here we are at uh, one of the asthma triggers. Uh, we, if you recall, we are back at the uh, keep it pest-free and keep it clean. And so uh, we get to talk about the fun stuff now, right? The, the mold and mice and rats and cockroaches and dust mites, and pet hair, and dander, and environmental tobacco smoke, and uh, VOC, the chemical odors coming off of VOCs. Um, as we, as we look at this, uh, you'll, you'll also learn, if you don't know, uh, what FRAS is. FRAS is the, uh, the waste material that comes uh, from mice and, uh, and uh, rats, I guess, and uh, things, words that you never knew uh, you needed to know. Um, but uh, so the signs of cockroach infestation, FRAS. Um, so each fecal pellet, or roach poop, if you will, uh, is, is called FRAS. It contains enough of the allergen VLAG1, LAG1, to trigger many asthma attacks. So that little tiny bit can trigger an asthma attack. And each and every pellet contains about 500 units of the allergen. This is why pest management is so important um, to combat uh, asthma. And as you may know, asthma is the number one reason that kids um, this school, there are about 14 million school days missed every year uh, because of asthma, and it costs us as taxpayers about uh, five to eight thousand dollars every time a child has to be hospitalized for asthma. So this is this is important. So getting rid of these pesky uh, rodents and uh, 
and bugs are, are pretty important. Um, so that's enough to trigger over 50 allergy attacks. Cockroach saliva, um, something I don't want to think about, I don't know about you, is also an asthma trigger. There's a great website. You may want to look at, at uh, the extension service at Penn State University, uh, a land-grant college that does uh, such a great job on IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Uh, that link is at the bottom of the slide, and we would encourage you to, to check it out for, for uh, pest management. So in Integrated Pest Management, to get rid of the cockroaches and bugs and uh, the like, is, is one approach to pest management. It, it looks at the house more and the problem more holistically, tries to solve for the root causes by relying on common sense practices. What it's doing is it actually looks at the life cycle of the different pests that are in the home and the type of pest, <clears throat> how they interact with the environment and how they're interacting with the home. And it manages pest damage with the most economical ma measures, but also the most environmentally friendly measures uh, to, be, to be least hazardous, at least toxic, uh, to the people and property and the environment. So some steps to reduce cockroach infestation. Um, I, I will tell you up top that when I moved into my first apartment, my mother believed in many of these um, kind of old country solutions, and one was to, to use cucumber shavings to keep roaches out. That is not one of our recommended uh, steps here. But uh, keeping food and garbage in closed, tight-lid containers, uh, and never leaving food out in the kitchen. Uh, it's a major thing that we send when we send in our environmental health inspectors is that even small bits of food that people uh, don't clean up uh, can be a, a great uh, feeding site for pests and cockroaches. That not leaving out pet food or dirty food, food bowls. Uh, we clearly want you to leave out water for Fido, but if you can make sure that Fido's food is put up at the end of the day, it's really important. Um, eliminating water sources that attract these pests, leaky faucets, leaky drain pipes. <clears throat> we think about those things from mold and mildew, but water is, a, is the source and survival uh, for uh, the cockroaches and other pests. Mopping the kitchen floor and washing countertops at least once a week uh, to reduce, I hate to say it here, folks, but urine and feces left behind by uh, pests and cockroaches and, and other uh, crawly things here. Plugging up crevices around the house through which cockroaches uh, can enter uh, is important. You can use uh, the wire mesh and, uh, to do that and help to do that. Uh, but dealing uh, with caulk and uh, other methods are important. Uh, using sticky traps where, where appropriate. Uh, and using boric acid in safe areas. Um, Wes, what would you consider to not the safe areas? Of not going to have food surfaces? Not accessible to children and pets. Okay. So being, being intelligent about where you put those uh, board acid places. So. And, then, and then using bait stations and other environmentally friendly, uh, safe, environmentally safe pesticides uh, to reduce cockroach infestation. Placing gel baits in areas where you see roaches and traps. And if you have particular questions and you want to uh, talk about this further, we have uh, Hector Morano and Lynn Wood Brown on our staff who would be happy to talk to you about uh, materials to be used in integrated pest management and, and measures and ways to uh, do periodic testing on this. You can also go to the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. So the signs of rodent infestation, <clears throat> the presence of live or dead rodents, that's a, that's a clear one. That's pretty easy. I don't know who put that bullet point up there, but there you go. Uh, Rodents nest, uh, bits of paper, straw, rags uh, that will be pulled together to, uh, in piles. Uh, you also get the rodent odor, a distinct odor that uh, you're going to know. It's not, not normal and you're smelling that. You, you're going to pick up on that. Uh, ro uh, droppings, uh, the activity and severity of the problem is the more droppings that you're seeing. An evidence of, of gnawing uh, around your baseboards and entrance areas. Uh, rub marks, uh, small rub marks may be an indicator of habitual pathways. Yeah. Runways, these frequently traveled paths, you'll also be able to see if you pay close attention uh, to the ingress and egress into houses uh, where you have rodent uh, traffic. Um, little footprints, uh, often we will see, and rat burrows, tunnels that are dug below ground 
Um, some of this is done, in, obviously, in small areas, but uh, what we look for. So here's some common rodent entries uh, and, and harborages. Uh, you can see they can come in through the attic. Uh, they can crawl up trees and go in through uh, your uh, chimney, uh, through, through the openings there, or through uh, vent pipes uh, opening in roofs. So it's not just coming in through the ground that you may see uh, this happening. Opening through vents on the grounds or gaps, on, gaps under doors or gaps under garage doors. Um, and interest into crawl spaces often. <clears throat> Obviously, trash cans uh, with lids off or just uh, calling for uh, rats to come and visit you, pet food, uh, bird seed feeders, and wood piles. And clutter uh, are all invitations uh, for harborage for uh, rodents. So let's talk about what we can do for, for keeping these guys out. Uh, and uh, just give you a fun fact from Baltimore. About uh, five years ago, we did a study in Baltimore. We didn't do it, the city did. And we found that we had 894,000 rats and only 605 human residents. So uh, we knew this was a problem. <clears throat> I just didn't know who had the job of having to count the rats, but it was a heck of a lot of rats. Anyhow, we're keeping pests out uh, for rodents uh, and with giving them no place to hide. You want to block the pest entries, uh, passages, and harborage, and you want to remove clutter. You need to seal holes and cracks uh, using wire mesh, caulk, and, and other materials that uh, to seal holes and cracks in foundations and entryways uh, into to the house. Making sure you have caps on your vent pipes where possible, that your attic entries are uh, have good mesh and uh, the slats are in place. We want to make sure that food and water availability are reduced greatly. Uh, working with residents to practice proper food storage uh, and disposable, disposal using tight lids on trash cans, not leaving dirty dishes in the sink overnight, and making sure that you're cleaning up or that there are proper cleaning techniques for crumbs and grease and water and trash. <clears throat> Conducting regular cleaning to reduce the urine and feces. Uh, and to make sure that you're keeping a clean and dry space. So uh, behavior education on cleanliness is a big part of our environmental health work that we do. And knocking down the population. Uh, traps uh, and appropriate pesticides only when needed. So steps to reduce dust mites and exposure to dust mites, uh, which can occur at most everywhere in your house, you hear about it often in pillows and beds and uh, the like, and that's why uh, we use in our work allergy blocking mattress covers and pillow covers. Uh, making sure the bed linens are washed weekly and are washed in hot water. Taking stuffed animals or, or pillows uh, and uh, washing them, you can also freeze them or put them in the dryer. The freezing or heat. Uh, can knock down uh, dust mites. And then using a HEPA filtered vacuum on all carpeted areas, on furniture and upholstery, uh, we recommend it throughout the house, uh, windowsills and, and floors as well, because not only does it pick up uh, dust mites allergens and allergens, <clears throat> it's a helpful mechanism to clean up leaded dust. And then keeping humidity levels down. You've heard this before in the VOCs. But keeping it down under 50% RH or by using a dehumidifier, ventilation, fan, or air conditioner. So the 11-6 guidance uh, talks about the health effects on asthma here and uh, in looking at pests. Uh, pest removal is allowed uh, where infestation would prevent weatherization. Infestation of pests may be caused for deferral if it's too great and cannot be reasonably removed or poses a health and safety threat for the workers. Again, education is really important here for everyone. Uh, screening of windows and points of access is also allowed to prevent intrusion after work is done. So here we're going to talk about keeping it clean. 
So when we're looking at cleaning, we're, we're looking at reducing uh, seven uh, big areas, uh, obviously bacteria and mold and mildew, uh, viruses, those uh, nasty dust mites we just talked about, pollen, which comes uh, is tracked into the house through windows and on the feet and doors, and then animal dander and cat saliva. We, we talk about some fun and interesting things here, don't we? Clutter is a major issue uh, in our weatherization work and one of, the, one of the most challenging in our overall healthy homes work. And these are pictures that uh, actually do exist in, cli in some clients' homes um, that uh, are beyond uh, some, some uh, comprehension, but even small areas of clutter of papers or recycling or, or clothing uh, can become major issues. Um, for, for cleanliness and, and attracting uh, mold, mildew, rats, rodents. So keeping it dry and keeping it well ventilated here, the removal of the clutter here, uh, we don't obviously is, is key to this and providing proper storage and proper containers. So we'll often provide plastic containers or furniture um, as well as assisting with the clutter removal. So keeping it dry and keeping it well ventilated. On the keeping it dry, there are lots of areas. Uh, water is can, it literally can seep into the home from almost anywhere. Uh, gutter overflows are an area that we see often, or poor, poor gutter downspouts or, or broken downspouts um, become a big area. Seepage, seepage through foundations and through walls, um, or through leaking HVACs or other mechanical. Uh, poor, poor window. Uh, the construction or uh, not having the right weather sealing on doors and, and uh, sliding glass doors can also be areas. So we can, through the basements, it can come in through uh, floor drains and cracks in the floor, cove joints, um, through uh, windows or those windows that are sort of below ground that uh, uh, hold moisture, and also through uh, pipe may be faulty or have busted. And even mortar joints where it can seep in because there hasn't been proper sealing over time. But also in basements you'll have uh, leaking washers uh, from your washer dryer or water heaters uh, or leaks that may come from above. And then and also the other place that we see a lot of water damage is in roofs. Uh, obviously poor tiling and poor roofing. Um, uh, and uh, is a big area in the uh, gutters and downspouts that we talked about, which can lead to, as you see here, a lot of mold and moisture, and a lot of annoyance that that guy has to hold that bucket for a long time catching the rain. Uh, plumbing leaks inside the home are often uh, a major source that people are uh, not thinking. When they think of leaks, they're thinking of roof leaks or big, bigger leaks, uh, but seepage from toilets, <coughs> from showers and bathtubs, Small leaks in pipes that are just not caught for a long time uh, can also be areas of faulty PVC piping on sprinkler systems can, can be another. These are all easily remedied. Uh, we also see a lot of water leakage that's coming in through uh, damaged um, air conditioners or poorly installed air conditioners or from underneath uh, refrigerators where it leaks continue and are often not seen until <clears throat> they've gotten to be rather large. So some places you might find mold. Obviously we see a lot of it in bathrooms, especially around the shower tub and on the walls and ceilings from leakage or where, and where there is also poor ventilation. In wet or damp basements and crawl spaces, uh, people who are often not checking in their crawl spaces uh, where there's a lot of dampness that especially on where, uh, in dirt floors, um, around leaky uh, bathroom and kitchen sinks. Uh, and under the sink, uh, you may see small drips and, uh, and damage and stains, but this should be corrected because over time they can become a big problem. Uh, in attics, under leaky roofs, on windows and walls where condensation collects, where there's poor indoor air quality or poor insulation um, or uh, uh, older windows, 
and under wallpaper or carpet uh, that is not being checked or hasn't been uh, been checked for a while, we'll, we'll often pull back carpet to find lots of uh, mold and uh, moisture. And then in and around uh, air conditioners uh, and uh, other mechanicals. So what can we do on mold prevention? Uh, obviously fixing the source, getting to the root of the problem in all of this is important. Um, fixing the leaking, uh, leaky plumbing and leaks in the building envelope as soon as possible. The key here for mold is obviously moisture control and proper ventilation. You want to keep an eye out for condensation and wet spots. Um, and making sure that uh, everything is clean and dry. If you have, a, have floods or uh, leakage within 48 hours, we would actually call for sort of immediate cleanup on that. Because even within 48 hours, uh, within 24 hours, you can have some serious mold issues uh, that can occur. We saw that coming out of Sandy, that within the first 24 hours, we had large mold buildup. And you want to throw away wet carpeting, mattresses, cardboards, uh, anything that has been wet for uh, more than two days or uh, less than that by better judgment. You want to keep heating, uh, ventilation, and air conditioning, your HVAC systems uh, intact. In you want to check the drip pans. Uh, you want to keep them clean and flowing properly and, all, and unobstructed. I know that Michael and I did a site visit in North Dakota where there was a lot of uh, mold and mildew and moisture problems, and underneath of the, of the mechanicals, there was a lot of lint and buildup, and so they were not able to help uh, perpetuate good indoor air quality. Uh, vent moisture uh, generating appliances, such as dryers, uh, need to vent to the outside, and those vents, uh, internal vents, need to be uh, kept clean as, and uh, to have periodic cleaning of the uh, extenders that are coming out of the dryers. You want to maintain low uh, indoor humidity, below 60% relative humidity. Your ideal is between 30 to 50%. And so checking for that on a periodic basis on a maintenance schedule is really important. And performing that regular building HVAC inspections uh, and, and building out of all of these elements of uh, a, a maintenance schedule, if you can uh, give to your clients a, a maintenance schedule uh, this is going to be very important for post-intervention uh, maintenance. So don't let the foundation stay wet. As soon as you're seeing any of, any uh, moisture build up, we need to do that to be remedied right away. And we need to ensure that there's proper drainage, and that there's proper sloping from the ground away from the foundation, uh, and if necessary, that we have uh, well-functioning sump pumps and, and other drainage mechanisms. Checking downspouts is a big issue. Uh, we had a family here, uh, we did a site visit with a number of years ago where we had done a lot of work, where they had two children with high asthma levels. They had uh, had a lot of issues getting weatherization done, all because their downspouts uh, didn't, have, didn't have the water pull away from the house. It was a $10 fix to save a lot of, a lot of issues and to be able to do the weatherization job. So making sure downspouts direct the rainwater away from the house and the gutters are working. And provide training where you can to residents and occupants about periodic cleaning of gutters or making sure they have proper gutter cover. Prevent moisture due to condensation by increasing surface temperature or reducing the moisture level in the air as well. So again, we're looking at asthma impacts on mold and moisture. Um, so you have under 11.6 that limited water damage repairs can be addressed by weatherization workers and correction of those moisture and mold creating conditions are allowed when it's necessary to perform the weatherization in the home and to ensure the long-term stability and durability of the measures. <clears throat> what we don't want to do is not fix a root cause problem that will degrade the weatherization investment over time and mainly because it's going to create a lot of asthma issues and other issues, uh, such as slip, potential slip issues and breaking down lead-based paint. So where there is severe mold and moisture, it does have to go to deferral and be referred uh, for intervention by a higher qualified contractor. Um, for drainage on gutters and downspouts, 
extensions and splashing. Major drainage issues are often beyond the scope of the weatherization assistance program. Uh, homes with conditions that may create a serious concern uh, require more than incidental repair need to be uh, deferred and referred uh, for mold and mildew uh, addressed by a trained contractor. Limited root cause remediation and replacement of sump pumps are allowed um, often under 11.6. And that's the replacement of a sump pump, not the purchase of a new sump pump. So keeping it uh, well ventilated, I think we're turning that over to Wes. I'm going to get some water and uh, get my voice back and let him take the ventilation uh, moving and moving forward. Uh, one of the components of a healthy home is a home that's, that's well ventilated. Um, that includes both venting out appliances that have combustible gases to the outside, but also improving the natural airflow in terms of outside air coming in, fresh air that's coming into the building. Um, this all acts as not only diluting the potential contaminants in a home, but also reduces VOCs, radon exposure, et cetera. Um, some of the contaminants that are improved by proper ventilation, again, we have mechanical systems that actually can remove air and take air to the outside. Uh, we also have HVAC systems that can bring in fresh air with fresh air intake to try to address and reduce the indoor contaminant buildup in a home, um, such as radon, VOCs, um, particulates, carbon monoxide, et cetera. Um, if you have appliances that are producing carbon monoxide, obviously remedying that appliance, repairing that appliance so it's performing and functioning properly is the first measure, and ventilation is the secondary um, measure to address that. Um, in homes, um, as part of an energy audit, one of the key components is that the auditor is looking for um, combustible appliances that are not performing properly in terms of performing different tests to measure that. And what we're looking for is the risk, obviously, of carbon monoxide and other gases that are being um, released into the home and it actually causes harm, potential harm, and in some cases death to the occupant. Um, so one of the functions of an audit is to look at um, venting and ventilation, but also are the combustible appliances working properly? That's a key component. Um, one of the uh, measures that we can install and is important as part of a healthy homes measure is to actually put carbon monoxide alarms in homes. Um, that's a very inexpensive measure anywhere, typically from uh, 19 to 30 dollars for a quality carbon monoxide alarm, but it's something that should be in every home that has a combustible appliance. And so that's an easy measure. Um, they're typically installed um, near the ceiling. Um, they're not installed directly over a, a combustible appliance, um, but that's an easy indication of is there a, me a measure of carbon monoxide built up in the home and how to make sure that a family and, and occupant is alarmed and aware after the auditing is over and after the weatherization. Um, Complementing the, the ASH uh, Healthy Homes Ventilation is actually the adoption by DOE and the Weatherization Assistance Program of the ASHRAE standards. Um, to increase ventilation in the home, um, again, that means increased natural air and fresh air intake for the home, but also venting out appliances to the outside, um, DOE adopted the ASHRAE 62.2 standards. Um, that includes proper testing of the home to measure the ventilation rate, to measure the um, fan flow and airflow in the home. It includes educating the occupant about the ventilation measures that were installed. Um, so when remediation is done to improve the ventilation, making sure the occupant is aware of what's been done to vent out and how to properly use those venting um, in mechanical installations. And the overall goal of ASHRAE is actually to improve the ventilation system and improve the indoor air quality in the home. One of the key aspects of, of healthy homes is actually improving the indoor air quality. And as homes are weatherized, historically, what is happening is that home is great, is sealed, and, and you're containing air inside the home, which is great. It reduces energy loss. But you're also can potentially sealing in contaminants that are being released, if not vented properly, to the outside. And so the ASHRAE program was adopted by WAP. It went into effect on January 1, 2012. And it requires WAP programs to the greatest extent possible to meet the ASHRAE 62 standards. Um, one of the most common elements is actually venting bathrooms and kitchens. Again, houses may have some natural ventilation, but after a test, you'll be able to determine what's the rate uh, of airflow in the home and ventilation. And, and in many cases, if there is no um, mechanical ventilation for the bathroom to vent out moisture and potential mold buildup, or also in the kitchen to vent out um, where we have stoves and other appliances, uh, kitchen vent system. 
Um, ASHRAE also asks that, that system be able to be used intermittently or continuously um, depending on the need of, of the home. Um, so ASHRAE, is, again, is a key component, and there's different measures in terms of spot ventilation or whole house ventilation um, that we'll get into a different webinar is coming up on the national um, NASCAP conference coming up. Uh, another element of a healthy home is actually a home that's safe. And so keep it safe is a, is a key component of a healthy home. Um, in the U.S., we actually have $222 billion uh, of a medical cost directly related to household injuries and injuries in the home. Um, it's also the household injuries the leading cause of death um, and disability among children and young adults. So there's a high cost in terms of medical cost, but also long-term injury um, um, to our most vulnerable populations. Um, some of the common household injuries that we, we see we're trying to prevent to a safer home are falls, um, electrical hazards, fires and burns, um, trips and falls, tripping hazards in the home, poisonings, and also choking hazard from household objects. When we talk with energy auditors and inspectors are going in the home, one of the things we also really encourage them to do is look for household injury risk and hazard risk and share that information with the occupants. Um, sometimes we have household injury risk, especially for young children, that may not result in a deferral, but that information is really critical to share with the occupants to make them aware of, of health and safety hazards that the inspector or the auditor has observed, and the family name may not be aware of them. Um, some of the key um, elements of keeping a home safer and reduce um, choking hazards in the home, um, putting covers on radiators in terms of preventing burns because of radiators um, heat and families aren't aware that children may be burned by that, installing cabinet locks in kitchens and bathrooms where we have storing household chemicals and other poisons um, to prevent children from being poisoned, uh, very inexpensive safety covers for electrical outlets, installing electrical outlet covers on outlets to prevent children from being potentially electrocuted. And also one of the common things we see with our inspectors are Stability of large appliances, the stability of furniture um, in terms of large TVs sitting on top of a dresser. Um, the family may not be aware just that by opening those drawers and, and, and leaving drawers open that actually may cause the dresser to fall over and actually injure a child or injure the occupants. And so those are some of the common sense things that are part of improving child safety um, in a home. Um, to address fire and burns, one of the, the key components is to make sure that all homes have smoke alarms installed on each floor. Uh, we recommend smoke alarms with 10-year lithium batteries. That also alleviates the need to change the battery every year, but also if that battery is not replaced, that smoke alarm becomes ineffective. Um, and so 10-year lithium batteries are, are a great approach. Um, a home that's healthy also has a fire escape plan, so the occupants know in the case of an emergency, in the case of a fire, how do they exit the building to get out safely and quickly. Um, in terms of burns, we talked about radiator covers and other areas. Actually, the temperature settings on hot water heaters, making sure it's at 120 degrees or lower so that the water temperature for bathing and showers does not pose a risk of scalding the actually or burning the occupants. Um, in terms of exposed wires, um, many homes um, have issues in terms of overloaded, overloaded circuits. There's limited um, electrical outlets, and so families use multiple um, wiring cords and cords on, the, on a single outlet. Um, knob and tube wiring is an old antiquated wiring system that may um, take place, especially in homes in New England, where it's not able to handle the voltage, and then we have the risk of fire because the knob and tube wiring is an older system that's not able to handle the voltage. Um, and the other things are just obviously exposed wires, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, in terms of structural hazards, uh, a home that's healthy and safe doesn't have risk of slip and fall hazards. Some of the easy common issues are, are trip and falls from cable cords or um, material that's left out that may trip an occupant, especially a child or a senior. But more commonly, we see um, stairs that are imbalanced in terms of the, the, the height of the stairs is, is different as, the, as you go up each step. We have stairs and railings that are missing railings, missing steps. And so those are elements that need to be addressed and actually are allowable expenses under the 11-6 um, weatherization guidance. Um, to ensure a safe home, some of the basic steps you can take, we talked about installing smoke detectors and carbon monoxide alarms. Um, those are, again, designed to make the occupant aware of a hazard and a potential immediate health threat. Um, storing chemicals, we mentioned in locked cabinets. Storing weapons, ammunition, and other hazardous materials in a locked cabinets away from children. Um, these are some very common sense measures. Um, but also reducing tripping and fall hazards that are specific to age populations. So, um, putting stair gates above a stair where a child may 
uh, run the risk of, of toppling down the stairs. Um, and installing um, slip grips in terms of um, tubs and also um, um, grab bars in tubs to also help seniors who may have a risk of slipping and falling in the tub. In terms of what WAP provides, uh, one of the key reminders is that the weatherization system program is not a rehabilitation program. Um, it's not designed to rehab a home. And so if there are major structural hazards, one of the key elements of the Green Health and Homes Initiative and the Weatherization Plus Health is actually to identify partners where you can refer families to address um, larger scale structural issues or rehab issues. And so those are not allowable costs um, for large scale rehab or, or, or um, structural repairs such as replacing a roof. Um, in terms of electrical, 11-6 um, does allow for minor electrical repair. Um, instances where we have exposed wiring that may threaten both the occupants but also the weatherization worker, those would be allowable repairs to be made. Um, similarly, in terms of fire hazards, something that may pose an immediate hazard to the family, those are allowable in preventing household injuries and also allowing the weatherization to go forward. Um, one of the key components of 11-6 in the guidance from the weatherization program is there cannot be household injury risk to not only the occupants but also the workers and the contractors. And so if there are health and safety risks that are minor in nature that can be addressed um, cost effectively, then WAP does allow those repairs to take place. If there's severe risk and severe hazards, they would result in deferral. But again, you know, we encourage programs to look for partners and funding sources to address those hazards rather than deferring um, a property from the program. Um, but all minor repairs that will allow the weatherization to proceed are allowable. An um, example is a basement stairwell. It's missing two steps. Um, that's a risk for the occupant, but especially for a weatherization contractor needs to do work in the basement. That's an allowable expense to replace those two steps and make sure that's not a, a fall hazard for the contractor coming into the home. Another key principle of healthy homes is actually keep it well maintained. Um, when we talk with families and owners about weatherization work and healthy homes work, one of the key components of that is actually to maintain that home, to maintain the intervention, but also to prevent a home from being unhealthy. Um, in terms of lead, we talked about chipping, peeling, flaking paint in the home that needs to be stabilized and done safely. Removing clutter that may cause pests in harbage areas and, for, and clutter that prevent weatherization from going on. Um, routine inspection of appliances. Again, there's, there's a, a partnership that needs to exist with, with clients that we all work with in terms of helping them maintain the home to do regular inspections of appliances that may cause um, fire hazards and others, they have to constantly inspect their property and not turn a blind eye once the weatherization program has left. Um, uh, Rick had mentioned in terms of basic maintenance, um, repairing clogged gutters and downspouts, making sure water is draining away from the house. Um, without that, water infiltration again can cause mold, chipping, peeling, flaking paint, and really impact the weatherization uh, effectiveness in a home. Um, so inspecting clogged chimneys, replacing HVAC air filters. Um, as, as we mentioned many times, we go into homes and the, the filter hasn't been replaced in five or six years. And so that creates a very unhealthy indoor air quality and also puts stress on the HVAC system itself. The last component um, of well-maintained is actually an educated owner, an educated occupant. And so one of the key recommendations from the healthy homes aspect is to make sure that post-remediation education occurs not only the energy efficiency side to help them maintain the weatherization, but also on the healthy home measures that are undertaken. So once the house has chipping, peeling, flanking, paint, making sure the owner knows how to do the work safely or hire a contractor to address it. Um, making sure they're reducing food and water sources that may contribute to pests and rodents and, and other um, contaminants coming back into the home that may address exacerbating asthma conditions and, and unhealthy um, conditions in the home. Um, in terms of thermostat settings, one of the great examples is if you install a programmable thermostat but the family's not aware of how to use it and they set the thermostat on 85 degrees, you're probably not going to realize the energy cost savings it was intended as part of the weatherization program. So post-remediation is a key component, really a last component once the weatherization intervention has occurred. And so that's really part of a healthy home strategy as well. So we I'm going to turn it back over to Ruth Ann. She's going to walk you through some of the healthy home strategies nationally. Yeah, and, and oh, Ruthie, uh, I'm sorry, before you, before you yep. go there, I just want to take a few questions, if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. 
Um, so the first question is, when you wash linens in hot water, you were talking about that to get rid of the dust mites. How hot does the water need to be? I, I think it's uh, so. Far, I, we will actually. I will actually get you the answer to that. I have, think it has to be more than 110 degrees, but it's. Uh, I, I don't want to be incorrect on that. Um, so we will email that. Uh, answer back. It should also be on our website at ghhi.org, but we will get the emailed answer back. Okay, and then the next question, how can the Healthy Homes Initiative help with the removal of clutter? Um, so we do that um, through work. We do a lot of behavioral health work in our, so in the way that the GHHI approaches is that when we have the environmental health assessment, the comprehensive assessment, um, to go in looking at energy and health and safety, we couple that inspector up with an environmental health educator who starts with the family and the owner, um, looking at um, the structural issues and the behavioral issues and the health issues uh, surrounding that family. Um, so there's two things that we are we're doing. One is that educator working with the family to talk about organization techniques, the health impact of clutter, uh, referral for mental health issues because often, you know, uh, exacerbated clutter issues often come. Um, coincide with depression um, or if, or a lack of resources for things like furniture and storage bins and we will work uh, through the environmental health uh, side and case management to do some training, some education and in, and in severe cases we will often work with our crews to do the removal and help people organize with a fresh start uh, on this but it's a very important part of long-term maintenance and uh, long-term care. So we, we put a lot of effort into it. Okay, thanks. And then the last question, under ASHRAE 62.2, what air exchange rate is recommended? Um, the air exchange rate actually is dependent upon the size of the house, and so there's a, uh, a lot of complex formulas based on the actual size of the house, and so um, I can provide some guidance offline if someone wants to send us specifics on the house they're talking about. Is, is there somewhere they can go for that uh, resource on that as well? Right. I mean, actually, actually, sixty-two point two, and we'll send that out, um, Raymond, if we can, to folks in terms of links for that information on ASHRAE. Some of it is proprietary. Some of it's available to the public. So, yeah, sure, we can coordinate that. Proprietary right. to ASHRAE. Right. 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 Great point. Yeah. Okay. okay, and that was the last question for now. So back to you guys. Okay. So uh, now that we've gotten through what uh, all of the clutter and all of the quote dry material, if you will. Um, you know, we're talking about the benefits of doing this work, and, and uh, so there are, you know, the, we talked at the top of this about the 30 plus million homes that uh, have uh, lead hazards and, and ho other homes that, that have asthma hazards and mold and mildew, but if you take the complex set of unhealthy housing, what HUD, HUD says there are about 6 million families who go to bed every night living in um, significantly unhealthy homes, and that that's a burden to trying to do proper weatherization, but it's also, uh, I think, a, a moral burden for all of us that we, we can actually improve kids' ability to go to school and be able to read better by lowering lead poisoning. We can improve school attendance um, by lowering asthma and then therefore improve uh, parents' opportunities to work and long-term long -term productivity by everyone. What we know is that by incorporating health and safety measures uh, with energy efficiency measures, that we're actually creating wealth retention for families, whether they uh, very low-income families, middle-class families. We're able to, to improve uh, marginal uh, wealth retention by lowering maintenance costs, by improving energy costs, and by not having missed work time and missed school time. And, and the longer term uh, aspects of that, of, of not having trip and fall injuries for seniors, um, not having uh, lead poisoning in, for kids, is that we're improving the overall cost in Medicaid, Medicare, CHIP, and other uh, uh, health uh, insurance related programs. And, and we have seen in our studies, our initial studies, the impact of doing energy efficient health and safety measures in an integrated fashion is that we can actually have an impact on preventing foreclosures and, and relieving mortgage distress and uh, stabilizing families in healthier, safer homes so that stable homes are also a critically important place and from which kids can grow and thrive and be able to enter the classroom uh, ready to learn. 
the, the, the federal uh, government agrees with this, this uh, outlook that uh, is promoted by NASCAS and the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative and many others. And so they formed at the, uh, in early 2009 an interagency work group on healthy housing, or what's called the Healthy Homes Work Group. Uh, the leading agencies in that include HUD, uh, the, uh, Health and Human Services through CDC and National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, the USDA, which many people don't think of as being engaged in uh, healthy housing, but uh, serve a lot through their extension services, their housing preservation grants and rural uh, programs, EPA, uh, Department of Energy, Department of Labor, and others who will join this, such as the Department of Education over time, uh, most certainly, um, and areas like uh, the Department of Aging through HHS are becoming more engaged uh, in this work. So this federal interagency work group put together a strategy for action that was, that was announced in February of this year. And the strategy um, for this group and for the, the uh, strategic plan that they put out was to promote comprehensive approaches to controlling and preventing major housing-related exposures and hazards. So Green and Healthy Homes uh, was founded under the principle of aligning public policy and programs, braiding resources um, to address comprehensively housing uh, issues from energy and high health costs, um, and to coordinate activities so that we can use housing as a platform for health and housing as a platform for economic uh, security for families. The, the strategy for action promotes that as well. It's working to identify and find ways to eliminate barriers that imp impede collaboration, that complicate assisting those in need. So one of the ones that is often used is the uh, varying income qualifications or varying qualifications for programs. So the interagency work group is working to address, uh, and I, will, I refer to it as smoothing out the qualifications for families if you qualify for weatherization assistance. Um, Many believe you should be able to qualify for all of the health and safety related programs that could help fix your home more comprehensively. Uh, often people will say if your child is on WIC or they are on uh, Medicaid, they should, then you should qualify for those uh, programs. Uh, we're moving more toward that uh, common standard. And also to, uh, the, the work group is collaborating with, uh, with key federal agencies and also non-federal stakeholders. So many of you who are working in this field to implement a healthy homes agenda to actually come up with a standard of uh, housing on proven uh, techniques uh, and proven standards for health-based housing and energy efficient housing. Um, so the strategy action has five goals. Uh, one is to establish healthy homes recommendations, standards and practices assessment tools, um, and, and, common, and common reporting standards. And then to encourage adoption of those Healthy Homes recommendations across the federal agencies and across state and local agencies, as well as in areas that, such as philanthropic investment or local, uh, local intervention standards. In goal three is to create and support training and workforce development to address health hazards in housing. So much uh, along the pathway of the RRP rule uh, and other training, but to have a more comprehensive set of green, healthy, and safe uh, workforce development standards. We did this uh, and put together a set of standards in across some of our sites in, uh, in the country. And in Buffalo, where we implemented these standards, workers who trained in the green, healthy, and safe standards uh, actually saw a two per, two dollar per hour rise in their wages in the first year, or four thousand dollars a year. That becomes a material impact on uh, workers and families um, uh, that uh, have been paid much lower wages by doing individual property maintenance work and the like. And then educating the public about healthy homes. Uh, one of the things we know is when we first started doing healthy homes work back in the late '90s, we were doing focus groups. And healthy housing was everything from uh, whether people felt safe in their home or whether there was trash in their street, um, how the, the stress issues of, of their own housing environment to the housing um, actual standards. And so really defining healthy housing and having people educated about how little things in their homes, putting lids on trash cans, fixing leaks around toilets, 
um, plugging holes so the pests can't come in. There's small things and then much larger things of mold and mildew, moisture and lead paint. All of them go together to create a healthy home and having the resonant understanding of their role and, and the access to resources is critical. And then supporting research that informs and advances healthy housing in a cost-effective manner. So I, the GHHI is involved in a big national study on the impact that uh, green, healthy, and safe housing interventions have on, for example, asthma uh, and kids going to the emergency department and to the hospital. In the first group of data that we had coming out of Baltimore, we showed that reduced by introducing uh, using green, healthy, and safe inter intervention standards in houses over a four-year period reduced the uh, incidence of uh, kids with chronic asthma from going to the emergency department to the hospital by 67 percent. Um, and that uh, paper written by Mike McKnight showed that by spending $1,500 to $2,500 in a home to fix the health and safety measures, often will reduce deferrals so that families are able to receive weatherization. Both of these render very, very large public costs. On the asthma reduction, you're saving millions of dollars if, and if we've adopted this nationally, billions of dollars in Medicaid costs. Um, if we're able to invest weatherization proceeds where they're intended to go, we're going to lower energy costs and improve uh, health and safety and housing. Um, Ruthie, so in housing. if I could just Yep. Ruthann, if I could just add that um, one of the most exciting things about that fifth goal is that, um, you know, we believe and our partners believe that there are many um, improvements on health and safety that weatherization uh, has an impact on that has not been fully captured uh, with, with uh, data and research. And so having um, that emphasis uh, be put on by the federal government uh, um, is exciting because there are impacts on indoor air quality, uh, and, and other aspects of health and safety that need to get captured in, in a way that can, that can really be quantified to, to really show some of the, the health-related savings that comes from weatherization, not just the energy-related savings. Right, and we think that that will provide opportunities for community action programs and health departments and housing departments around the country to attract um, investments, as we've seen in green and healthy homes from utility foundations, corporate and philanthropic foundations, but also will focus the federal government and state and local government on areas of, of need. Uh, the case on green and healthy homes was so compelling in the state of Maryland that the Public Service Commission has just recently invested $38 million to advance the uh, green and healthy homes work, both in the city of Baltimore for $19 million and in the state for $19 million. Th this kind of evidence-based um, work and collect the data collection that could show the need has, has really compelled uh, investment and can do that around the country. Um, so in the strategy for action, some highlights. Um, they added the term thermally controlled, energy efficient as the eighth element of the healthy home, what we'll I call it the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, they cited the integration and healthy homes models like the famous Healthy Homes Initiative um, and the Opportunity Council in Washington uh, state as, as excellent examples of this uh, work to integrate uh, weatherization with health and safety. Um, weatherization plus health is specifically listed in the report as an outstanding model of, of how to work and great kudos to NASCASP and uh, Department of Energy on that. Uh, EPA and DOE's work on the healthy indoor environment protocols for home energy upgrades uh, has been a great standard. Um, and uh, they, they show the standard of work specifications for the home energy upgrades as an example of where the interagencies uh, have come together and worked. Um, they promote the integration of training in both weatherization and healthy homes. It's an opportunity not only to advance work, but as we noted earlier, it's, it's a workforce opportunity to help community action programs around the country to think about sustainability. Um, and, and to um, broaden the skills in the healthy homes field as well. And aligning weatherization uh, under the strategy for action with other programs, eligibility requirements is an opportunity. Uh, that's the income qualifications and the uh, grant uh, reporting grant qualifications. So those are, we think the strategy for action will go a long way in helping to support uh, long-term sustainability of budgets for 
for weatherization, for healthy housing, for lead hazard control, um, but also inspire investments from other uh, sources. There's a lot of work being done on how to capture the Medicaid and healthcare savings. And under the Affordable Care Act, uh, there's a number of opportunities through both the community, hospital community benefits and hospital community building opportunities so that nonprofits, health departments, housing departments, departments uh, community action programs can actually um, be funded by local health care organizations and big health care organizations to perform health-based housing work that reduces lead poisoning, asthma, and trip and fall injury. And it makes the case that weatherization and energy efficiency are important factors in that. In fact, in the Healthy Homes Rating System promoted by HUD, uh, extreme heat and extreme cold are number two and three out of the 29 priorities of care. Um, so we're happy to answer questions on um, on any types of ways to capture investments or to advance the strategy for action or how you can put a strategy in place, um, you can contact um, our partners at NASCAS um, at nascas.org. Uh, we encourage you to go on the weatherization plus health uh, .org website to find uh, healthy homes resources in your community. Uh, and the list of the NASCAS staff, the staff is on this slide. And our staff here of uh, our 35 or 40 plus employees here at uh, Green and Healthy Homes Initiative are here to help you as well. Our website is ghhi.org. Uh, and we look forward to any questions that you may have now or, or later. Uh, our um, My email address is ranorton at ghhi.org. Uh, Michael McKnight is M McKnight. And Wes Stewart is GW Stewart uh, at ghhi.org. Thanks, Ruthanne. And we do have two questions at the moment. Um, the okay. first one, and, I, and we may go, we may go a little over time, right, Raymond, and be fine. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Good. So the first question: Does there exist printed material which can be given to a weatherization client to explain ASHRAE 62.2 and meet the need? and meeting the need for installing and maintaining ventilation? There, there is some education material on ventilation and um, installation, but it doesn't get into all of the guidelines on maintenance that we're, that's in, in simple form currently, but that's a great uh, product that I think needs to be developed, and we'd be happy to work with some folks to do that, but we can forward you um, educational materials um, on, on ventilation. Um, and the need for ASHRAE, um, and, and certainly you can post that. Okay, and then finally, how can we get a copy of the data showing asthma reduction by 67%? Uh, we can send it to you. It's Baltimore data. Um, and we can, we certainly, if anybody wants to email me, I can send you the uh, uh, basis for that data and um, other other outcomes that we've seen uh, in the first uh, phase of uh, Green and Healthy Homes, that's Bal that comes out of our Baltimore site. So we have a number of pieces of data that are coming out of great sites such as Cleveland and Detroit and others, uh, and we'll share as much of that as, uh, as we can. Okay, and then we have one more question asking if the data is available um, that you presented to the Public Service Commission on the uh, health-related savings. Uh, the Proposals for Public Service Commission, we can find out if we can share those, and if we are can do that, we will ask Baltimore City and the State of Maryland um, uh, if they can uh, share that, and if, if we can do that, we will post them on our website and let uh, NASCAS uh, know that, and we'll also see if we can post them on Weatherization Plus Help. Okay, and Ruthann, can you give your email address one more time? R.A. Norton at leadsafe.org, or at ghhi.org. Sorry, we just changed. And I'll put it right up here right now. OK, it looks like those are all the questions we have for today. Um, I just want to let every, first of all, well, I want to thank uh, Ruth Ann and Wes and Mike for joining us today and doing this presentation for us. And I'd like to let everyone on the call know that you will be receiving a feedback questionnaire following the webinar, and we would appreciate your responses as those answers will help us to determine 
um, the future design of uh, webinars upcoming. And our webinar series will continue next week with the crash course in the introduction to WAP. And you are able to register for that uh, through our website, um, wxplushealth.org. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and wish everyone a good afternoon. Raymond, can thank I you. just do one last thing and encourage people, if they want the advancing strategies, uh, the strategy for action uh, that came out of the interagency work group, they can go to hud.gov slash lead. Yes, and that's available on our site as well, wxplushub.org. Yeah. Super. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks.